Well, good morning again. Welcome to Zoom Church number five during this lockdown. Uh, it's not exactly the same as being together, but it's a lot better than um, not seeing each other's faces. And so I uh, trust you've been enjoying the, the pre-service chat and I encourage you to stick around at the end of the service uh, for a little bit more of um, informal chatting with one another. During the service this morning, we're continuing our series in 1 Samuel. And uh, this is uh, week four of the series and Brad is going to be preaching to us from chapters uh, 8 through 12. And we'll be thinking a bit about leadership and uh, the, the trouble with giving sinful people authority. And so I thought I might start this service with Jesus talking about leadership and uh, his take on the way that leadership and authority should be used. Jesus says to his disciples, this is in Mark chapter 10, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve, but uh, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And so that's uh, Jesus' take on how you use authority. You use it in the service of others. And I will, I'm sure I will be exploring uh, that a little bit more as we get to the uh, the sermon later on in the service this morning. I thought I might take this chance also to uh, interview Leah, um, who's, you know, as you know, is our youth and children's minister, and she's been doing a whole lot of stuff with the youth group and the, and the kids, and uh, just to um, fill us in on what's been happening uh, with that side of the ministry. Good morning, Leah. Good morning. Um, now, before you tell us about uh, the ministry side of things, uh, tell us about the family side of things. Are you guys going stir crazy at home with three young kids oh uh, look some days we are um definitely during the holidays it felt like we we couldn't go and do a lot of the things that um would have that they would have been really excited to do and uh, we are getting a bit sick of each other's company um so yes yes we are but we're also trying to appreciate the time we have all together which is yeah. which is good have you got any activities that you've been have been the go-to to keep everybody occupied Look, we've done lots of craft, made lots of mess. We've built lots of things. We've destroyed lots of things. Um, we, Graham took the kids swagging out in the backyard one night, uh, which they enjoyed and it rained on them, but they still enjoyed it. And lots of walks and, and things like that. So swagging, that's like camping, but with less space. Yes. Yeah, little tents. Little tents. Okay, good. Um, and now, many people may not know that you're uh, actually at the moment in the process of um, being ordained. You're a your candidate for ordination and uh, getting towards the end of that, that process. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with uh, what ordination means, it's, it's the diocese uh, setting aside somebody for ministry. So there's a, an element of saying, we recognise that ministry in this person's life is, is not just a passing phase. They've committed their life uh, to Serving the God, serving God in this way in a um, in a substantially paid capacity, and it's also a recognition from the diocese that uh, of endorsement that we think this person is a uh, a qualified and a um, authentic minister of Christ. And so, uh, Leah, shortly you'll become, um, if it all goes according to plan, uh, <laughs> Reverend uh, Dyson, uh, and you'll be a, a deacon. Yep. Uh, so, tell us how how is what is that process, and how has it been going? Yep. Uh, so for me, it's a little bit different than your standard go through more college and um, uh, do ordination because I went through Youth Works College and then SMBC. Um, I've needed to do one extra subject, which has to do with Anglican history and liturgy, which is looking at things like the 39 articles and the prayer book and, and those sorts of things that we use um, in, in the Anglican church. Uh, so I've been doing that this year and uh, it's just about eight classes over the course of the year and uh, when I finish that then I'll have an exiting interview and if all goes well then uh, ordination in February next year. Okay nice so you uh, are you feeling more Anglican? <laughs> Not really like it's, it's been actually really interesting looking at the the history um, of it it's, it's really intriguing to see uh, where we are at as the Anglican Church and why we're there. So I've really enjoyed it. 
No, fantastic. And it's wonderful that the, the diocese would like to recognise you in this way um, and endorse uh, your ministry. Uh, now, okay, tell us about youth group. What's been happening with the youth? Yep. So for youth group, we're meeting online via Zoom on Fridays and uh, we're enjoying just reconnecting with each other and uh, we're going through an, an overview of the Old Testament is what we're doing this term. So that's that's youth group. Okay, so kind of people have been Zooming in yep okay nice all right what about um kids church yeah so for kids church uh we've been doing episodes uh everybody all of the the families uh suggested that it might be easier to do episodes rather than live zooms and so yeah each week i uh do some stuff on the the video and jazz helps me out and then we put it together and send it off and they have the chance to to keep learning about confidence which is what we've been doing in july and then come next week and August we'll be learning about wisdom. Okay, nice. Uh, when we had our last parish council meeting, one of the, the parents in parish council spoke up and said how much their children, their child was loving the uh, the episode approach and just really getting a lot out of it. So must uh, must be going well. Uh, also tell us about, um, what about kids club or, and uh, junior drivers? What's the, what are your plans there? Yep, so for junior drivers, uh, like we did last, Last year we did episodes um, and craft packs so the families have been able to pick them up from outside the hall and uh, each week they can watch along uh, and sing along and do music and stuff like that so I've had really good feedback um, from from that and the craft packs and the families are really enjoying uh, the Junior Jivers episodes and for Kids Club we're doing um, really short episodes of just a, a quick Bible story uh, having the junior leaders participate in things like prayer and the song um, and the memory verse. And it's just a way for us to, to touch base with them, show that we're still thinking of them, praying for them, um, and a short thing to keep uh, encouraging them in their faith as well. Yeah, great. So you you and the leaders have been pretty active in, um, in still serving the, the youth and the kids in, in this way and helping them keep growing in the faith. Um, we're going to show a, a clip now that um, just you, you set it up for us. What's, what's this clip about and who did you make it for? Yep. So uh, for Kids Club, uh, we have a great, wonderful bunch of junior leaders uh, that have uh, really faithfully been um, training and also wanting to participate. And so when we've had to go online, uh, we've wanted to really help them contribute towards the episodes and things like that. So I gave them different things that they could do this term. Uh, some of them are doing the memory verses, some of them are doing um, the prayers and a bunch of them did a song for us, uh, which is the song that the, gets sent out every week and we're doing, uh, this is Amazing Grace, because we're looking at Jesus, the servant king through the Gospel of John. And so they put together this video for us and uh, I thought it was great and we could show you guys as well. All right, let's have a, have a watch of that now. Thanks. One, two,
Uh, thanks for that, Leah. I can just picture um, the kids at home with their headphones on, dancing around and doing the actions uh, with their leaders um, and singing God's praises. Hopefully we didn't traumatise uh, too many people with the, uh, the visual of a, a real lamb. Um, maybe they don't know what the word slain means. But uh, <laughs> anyway, good, good to see so many people getting involved in the kids' ministry. Uh, we're going to have our Bible readings now. And um, who's doing the first one? Oh, Susie. So Susie Johnson. Good morning, Susie. You'll have to unmute yourself. Morning. Good morning. How's, um, Susie, before you read, tell us how's the uh, lockdown affecting your day to day at the moment? Um, it, it's sort of similar. Uh, nothing much has changed. I still go to um, work at New March and come home and um, uh, do the shopping for us and, and for mum, but yeah, missing the, the family. Um, that that would be a sort of good summary. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, please read the Bible to us. Okay. It's from 1 Samuel 8 1 to 9 2. That's 1 Samuel 8 1 to 9 2. When Samuel, Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons judges for Israel. The names of his firstborn was Joel. And the name of his second was Abijah. And they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes and perverted justice. So all the elders gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king leading us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly. Let them know what the king who will reign over them will do. Samuel told them all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, this is what the king will do, will, will reign over you, will do. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses. And they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will sign to the commanders of thousands and, and commanders of fifties and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. 
He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his commanders. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vin vintage and give it to his officials and attendants. Your manservants and maidservants and the best of your cattle and donkeys, he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flock and yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard that the people, what the people, that the people said. He repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Then Samuel said to the men of Israel, everyone go back to his town. There was a Benjaminite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zeor, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphiah, of Benjamin. He had a son named Saul, an impressive young man without, without equal among the Israelites, a head taller than any of the others. Here ends the reading. It's better, God. Well, thank you, Susie. And we're going to um, skip the first part of uh, chapter nine and pick it up halfway through chapter nine with our second reading, uh, which Sue Mingay is going to bring to us. Good morning, Sue. Good morning, how are you? Good, thanks. And uh, how are you going? How's, how's lockdown affecting your day to day? Mm, we're just home, the four of us, me, Paul and the two kids, homeschooling. Well, they do their own schooling, so they're yeah. old enough to do that now. Yeah, and just a bit like Groundhog Day. <laughs> Every day is the same, almost. Um, cooking and eating a lot. <laughs> yep. That all sounds very familiar. <laughs> <laughs> All, yeah. right. All right, well, thanks, Sue. Um, you wanted to pick up the story for us. Yeah, no worries. So today's reading comes from 1 Samuel 9, 14 to 10, 1. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming towards them on his way to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord revealed to the, this to Samuel about... About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked unto my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you will eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them. They have been found, and to whom is all the desire of Israel returned? of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line. Saul answered, but am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? Why do you say such thing to me? Then Samuel brought Saul and his servants into the hall and seated them at the head of those who were invited about 30 in number. Samuel said to the cook, bring the piece of meat I gave you, the one I told you to lay aside. So the cook took up the thigh with what was on it and set it in front of Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been kept for you. Eat, because it is set aside for you for this occasion from the time I said. I had invited guests and, Sam and Saul died dined with Samuel that day. 
after they came down from the high place to the town, Samuel talked with Saul on the roof of his house. They rose about daybreak and Samuel called to Saul on the roof, get ready and I will send you on your way. When Saul got ready, he and Samuel went outside together. As they were going down to the edge of the town, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to go ahead of us. And the servant did so. But you stay here for a while so that I may give you a message from God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Great. Thanks, Sue. And um, I'm going to hand over to Brad now, who's going to unpack that those this passage for us. So thanks, Brad. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Brad. Uh, let's pray together. We're looking at uh, uh, chapters 8 through to 12, covering five chapters. Um, but so I'm going to briefly cover the main narrative and bring out uh, the important points for us. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, your living and active words. And we ask that you will, uh, through your spirit, speak to us today from your word, that it may serve uh, to help us to know you better. And I pray that you will help me as I preach it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Okay. Now, leadership is one of the greatest pressing human needs. We are looking for someone to tell us what to do. Uh, look at our own country at the moment. We're looking to our governments to tell us how to beat this pandemic. We're expecting our political leaders to come up with the solution to the problem, whether to lock down or not, which vaccine to take and when, when to get tested and so on. And then if they don't deliver, boy, are we quick to tell them that we're not happy with them. We are looking for our leaders to save us. We are looking for leadership. Salvation is linked to leadership because salvation comes from a saviour who is also a leader. And many of the great world leaders, whether good or bad, have recognised this fact and have acted as a form of saviour, offering to save people from something. Uh, even Hitler, not a great leader, but he was promising to save the German people and make them a racially pure race. Mikhail Gorbachev, the leader of the Soviet Union, said he was going to save the world by ending the Cold War and dismantled the Soviet Union. And now we have the G7, the governments of the top seven economies, promising to save the world from climate change. Leaders telling us they're going to save us. Chapter eight in the book of 1 Samuel uh, is a turning point in Old Testament history. It marks a change in the leadership of Israel. It's a transition from theocracy to monarchy, a transition from judgeship to kingship. It's a transition from living under God as their king, with a judge who was their priest and prophet, to living under a human king who will lead them in a way that is influenced by human thinking. This section of 1 Samuel is all about Israel's search for a leader, one who will be their saviour, even though they actually already had one. They just forgot. Now, the people were unhappy and they wanted change. Up until now, they've been depending on God to raise up judges and lead them as they were needed. Their judge at this time, Samuel, now he may have contributed to their unhappiness by appointing his sons to succeed him, but uh, they weren't doing a very good job. So instead of asking for the sons to be removed, the people asked for a king to lead them. Their battles with the Philistines have been recurring and uh, it seemed Israel was enjoying a brief time of relative calm, but it, uh, it looks like they're expecting trouble again at any time. And the phrase that stands out is, like all the other nations. That's the key here. Rather than living God's way, they're choosing to follow the ways of the world around them. Ultimately, it is a rejection of the kingship of God. Samuel, the boy who Hannah prayed for, was dedicated to God's service, became a judge and priest. He's now in old age. Our judges were appointed by God 
to lead the people on his behalf, but God was still their king. Samuel is the last in a line of judges, and God worked through Samuel because Samuel was a willing servant. Samuel is in the process of transitioning to his two sons to succeed him, uh, but they're not doing a very good job. It may be of comfort to uh, some of us to see that Samuel is not the only father to see his children wander away from the Lord. They are corrupt. They are taking bribes and perverting justice, and the people are not happy. They see the nations around them doing okay under their own kings, and Israel living as 12 tribes, each with his own leader, uh, probably had some power struggles going on. They thought, if only we had a king, one that would unite us, so the people say, Give us a king to lead us like all the other nations. But in reality, what has happened is they are ignoring the fact that God is already their king. Now, you can just imagine Samuel's reaction. Now, remember, Samuel is a prophet, so he'd be on regular speaking terms with God. Uh, I think the conversation might have gone something like this. God, you know, did you hear what they want now? They no longer want me as their judge. They want a king. What are we going to do with these people? I try and I try, but they just won't listen. Have you got any ideas? And God tells Samuel in verse 7, give them what they want, because it is not you they are rejecting, but they are rejecting me as their king. So give them what they want, but warn them what it will be like living under a monarchy. So Samuel warns them. Now, we know from history, kings and queens love building up an empire based on accumulating wealth and employing large workforces. And of course, I don't just mean our Queen Elizabeth. We all know Solomon from Old Testament history. But just uh, three kings of the world today, of Thailand, Brunei, and Saudi Arabia, for example. Now, these kings have private fortunes, not, not the country's money, their own personal wealth in the billions accumulated from the natural resources of their own countries, people employed to serve them. So Samuel warns them in verses 11 to 18, what it will be like living under a king. He says, your sons will be conscripted into military service or to work in these fields. The king will take your daughters to serve as cooks and bakers. He'll take a tenth of all your produce and your flocks. He will take your servants, the best of your cattle and donkeys, and you yourselves will become like slaves. Life under a king will be a life of serving that king. But the people refused to listen. No, they said, we want a king. We want a king to fight our battles. I think it might have sounded like uh, one of those marches going down George Street in the city, you know, where they go, what do we want? A king. When do we want it? Now. So verse 21 Samuel goes back to the Lord and says, God, are you sure you want to go through with this? And the Lord answers them. He says, listen to them and give them their king. Now, chapter 9 starts with an ordinary family doing ordinary things. A man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin has a son named Saul. He was very tall and it seems he was very good looking. Now, some of Kish's donkeys go missing. So he sends his son Saul and one of his workers to go and find them. And behind this ordinary scene, God is using these circumstances to bring Saul to Samuel, while at the same time telling Samuel that the man he is bringing to him will be the king the people want and that Samuel is to anoint him. Verse 15. Now, the day before Saul came, the Lord has revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the tribe of Benjamin. Anoint him leader over my people Israel. He will deliver my people from the hands of the Philistines. I have looked upon my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord told him, This is the man. He is the one who will govern my people. Samuel starts preparing Saul, giving him hints that something special is about to happen to him. He invites him to an important banquet. 
that Saul says, uh, look, what's going on here? I'm just a Benjamite. I'm the least of the least. Why are you showing me all this attention? You know, Saul is a country boy with no ambitions of leadership. He says, look, I'm just here looking for a couple of donkeys. Samuel seats Saul at the head of the table. And he says to the cook, okay, you know that slow roasted leg of lamb you've been uh, had in the oven all morning? You can bring that out now and put it in front of Saul. Saul is being treated very special. They enjoy the meal. And the next morning, Samuel and Saul go up onto the roof and spend time talking together. Now you can imagine Saul's thinking, what is, when is this guy going to tell me what all this is about? And Samuel explains to him, verse 27, I've got a message for you direct from God. Verse 10, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on Saul's head and kissed him saying, has not the Lord appointed you leader over his inheritance? Now, anointing is a symbolic act, consecrating a person whom God has chosen for a special role. Okay, there's nothing special in the oil. It is merely symbolic, a special role for a priest or a king. Here, Saul is anointed, is anointed privately. Later, Saul will be acknowledged publicly. Samuel tells him, look, don't worry about the donkeys. They've been found. As you head back home, you will meet some men who will give you some food and you're going to bump into a procession of people playing music and prophesying. And verse 6, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you in power. You will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Everything that's happened in this section has occurred exactly how God has said it would. God's word in action. God is with Saul, but that doesn't mean he can just do whatever he likes. God has a specific plan and a job for him to do. Seven days pass, and then Samuel the prophet summons all the people to come and hear what he has to say. He's got three simple points to make from verse 19. Number one, remember what the Lord has done. The Lord brought you out, your forefathers out of slavery in Egypt. And on more than one occasion, he has delivered you from the nations oppressing you. Number two, he says, but look what you have done. You have rejected your God, the God who saves you out of all these calamities. And you have said, set a king over us. And number three says, and therefore, present yourselves before the Lord. You have asked for a king. Well, here he is. At first, Saul is a reluctant leader. When Samuel calls all the people together, Saul can't be found. Finally, he comes out. Samuel presents Saul to the people and says, do you see him? This is the man the Lord has chosen. And all the people shout, long live the king. Samuel explains to everyone how this new system is going to work. He has all the regulations written down, presents it before the people and God. Saul is acknowledged as king, but not by everyone. Verse 27 says there's st still a few troublemakers who doubt Saul's ability to lead. Well, chapter 11 is Saul's chance to prove his worth. We have the Ammonites attacking the nearby town of Jabesh Gilead. Saul hears of what's about to happen. He burns with anger. Verse 7 says, He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, sent them throughout Israel with the message that this is what will happen to any man who does not follow Saul and Samuel. God's power comes upon him. Saul musters the men of Israel. He goes out, defeats the Ammonites, and he's hailed as a hero. After the battle, Saul is confirmed among the people as their king. But Saul is giving the glory to God. Verses 13, 14, 15, Saul says, No one shall be put to death today, for this day it was the Lord that rescued Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, let us go to Gilgal, and there we will reaffirm the kingship. So all the people went to Gilgal, confirmed Saul as their king in the presence of God. 
they sacrificed fellowship offerings before the Lord. Saul and all the Israelites had a great celebration. Giving God the glory for this victory was the right thing to do. Saul is acknowledging that it was only possible with God to have won the victory at all. In chapter 12, is Samuel's address to Israel. The kingship has been reaffirmed. Samuel, the judge, can now start thinking about retirement. Samuel is formally handing over the leadership of Israel to its new king, Saul. But he gives them three warnings as he does so. Firstly, he reminds them again that it was God who rescued their forefathers from slavery. Now, this was obviously a very important thing in Israel's history. It's mentioned uh, three times just in the uh, five chapters we're looking at today. Graham mentioned it last week. This was a significant part of Israel's history that they are constantly reminded of. So he says, remember, it was God that did that. And then he says from verse 12, but when you saw that Nahash, the king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord, the God, the Lord your God already was your king. So here is the king you have chosen. The one you asked for, the Lord has set Saul as king over you. Even though they rejected God as their king, God still chose the one who would be their king. It was the asking for a king that was the real sin here, because it was asking for a replacement of God. And then the final warning, verse 15, but if you do not obey the Lord, his hand will be against you. Verse 19, the, po the people say to Samuel, he wants him to, wants him to pray for all of them on their behalf. Pray to the Lord your God for your servants so that we will not die. For we have added to all our other sins the evil of asking for a king. Samuel says, do not be afraid. Yes, you may have done all this evil, but do not turn away from the Lord. Serve the Lord with all your heart. They acknowledge their sin. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people. Verse 22, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. And verse 24, be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart and consider what great things he has done for you. The people of Israel had a strategy of their own for securing their nation. They asked the prophet Samuel to give them their king so they could be like the other nations. They are granted their request, but only up to a point. God gives them their king, but he does not abandon them completely. Even though they rejected him as their king, God does not forsake them. God sends an unknown young man to Samuel. Samuel anoints Saul as leader of God's people to save them from the Philistines. Saul was at first a reluctant leader. He proves his worth in battle. He's hailed as a hero and rightly gives God the glory. The people realize their sin. They repent and renew their loyalty to their true king. Now we can be like Israel. We sometimes forget that God is our king. We have a, a tendency uh, like the Israelites to assess our situation pragmatically uh, rather than spiritually our initial response might be to think see there's something wrong with the way we're going about this so let's just adjust what we're doing and then we should be able to succeed rather than looking at what god has to say to us sometimes we may even see our fellow christian brothers and sisters we see what they have or we look around and see what other people are doing or succeeding doing better than us and we want to copy what they're doing. It's almost as if we're saying, oh, they must have the right king. Uh, let's have, we want a king like those people over there. We don't want to be different. We want to be like everyone else. We want to go with the crowd rather than trust and obey what God is telling us to do. Yet despite all this, even when we do go our own way, God does still not abandon us. When we chase after useless idols that will do us no good 
or when like me you might try to always do things under your own strength in your own selfish and stubborn ways god does not reject us he doesn't say look that was your last chance so see you later no he welcomes us back to the fold not because of anything we do but because he is pleased to make us his own it is at his own pleasure that we can call ourselves Christians. Israel were to be the Lord's treasured possession. Exodus 19.5 tells us, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, priests uh, were mediators between God and the people. Israel were to be God's mediators to the nations. In other words, God in relation to the world through Israel. And from our New Testament, 1 Peter 2 verse 9 tells us that we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood and a people belonging to God. Israel was the Old Testament priesthood. We are today's priesthood with Jesus as our priest and king. God in relationship to the world through Jesus, the king. The kings and leaders of this world are just as flawed and just as sinful as you and me. They may be able to give us some security, some peace and some justice. But whenever any form of human leadership replaces God as the object of our trust and obedience, we need to remember what happened to Israel at Gilgal. There really is only one king who can give us security, peace and justice and do all that perfectly. And that is King Jesus. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus came to announce the coming kingdom of God. He spoke about it all the time during his time on earth. As Christians, our citizenship is in heaven. And we are looking forward to that great day and that coming kingdom. But for now, we can take comfort that we have Jesus, who is not only our saviour, but he is our saviour and our king. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you and praise you as our God, our father and our king. And we thank you that we have King Jesus, King Jesus in our lives to lead us. So Father, help us to always not only remember that, but to put King Jesus first in our lives as our saviour, our leader and our king. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for that, Brad. Uh, we're going to have a, a hymn now. Uh, to help us reflect and internalize the, that message from from Brad uh, from the scriptures and remember Samuel's last words were uh, consider what great things God has done for you and serve him faithfully with all your heart this hymn is really a prayer that says God I just don't want to stay the same uh, year after year um, decade after decade I want to grow in godliness and um, so please change me uh, transform me from glory into glory it's a beautiful old hymn love divine or love's excelling let's uh, take these words to heart Thank you. 
beautiful hymn and uh we're going to continue in a time of prayer now uh with james so uh good morning james good morning both yes wonderful to uh be able to pray together as god's people and um can i ask you to lead us in prayer now yeah. thank you let us pray lord we give thanks for our warm homes and plentiful food and families together with the friendly, safe community of peoples in Coverty and nearby areas. We are grateful for the days of growing daylight and the bird songs we hear each morning as the day awakes. We pray our gratitude for these blessings never ceases. Lord, as we gather before you today in our own homes and reliant on modern technology, phones, mobile phones, internet, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok and Zoom, to communicate with each other in the present battle with COVID-19 virus. Your presence amongst us is a wonderful comfort to all, and we are reminded of those words which were uttered so long ago by your son, Jesus Christ, to remind and comfort one and all in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20. For when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. And without the need for any modern technical developments, just our desire, to pray. So let us exclude all other wayward thoughts as we offer our prayers today. Lord, we pray for our church, our minister Dave Barry and his family. We pray for our youth and children's minister Leah Dyson and her family. And we pray all for all those who by their efforts to serve to make the church community of Cobley Parish a warm and welcoming church community. And we pray, Lord, for the services of a senior minister yet to be appointed to pray for his work amongst the older residents of Cobley Parish to grow their understanding in you, Lord. Lord, in these times of great uncertainty, we pray that you will be with our parish community to help and care for all who are in difficulty. We think of those who will have experienced disruptions in their work life, whether it be bankruptcies, loss of home due to mortgage arrears or loss of employment. Please help our church community to be willing to help, generous in their help, and always be guided by those ideals of true Christianity towards their neighbours and all who are suffering setbacks and loss of income. Lord, we pray today for those who are sick and suffering. We pray especially for Cass and Leo and ESA health is restored. We pray for any who have had some serious conditions detected and await a recommended treatment program. And we pray for those old, of older years as their lives become more constrained with challenging health issues as age makes its inevitable progress on the independence of living. We ask, Lord, that you are with each of them in their individual journeys and to provide one and all with a great peace of mind through their Christian faith. We pray, Lord, today for the Olympic team in Tokyo. We pray you will keep them safe and protected from any illness. You, we pray that you will encourage them to use their wonderful talents that you have made possible to achieve their best results. We pray for their safe return to Australia and their homes. And we ask, Lord, today that you hear these prayers in the name of your only Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, James. As we finish up this morning, just a couple of announcements. 
Um, you may have received one of these uh, in the mail with our 2021, the new parish directory. So thank you to Kathy, who's been um, distributing those. And you can see inside this got everyone's contact details and little thumbnail photos so that we can uh, make sure we learn everybody's name and be able to stay in contact uh, during the, the lockdown. If you haven't got one yet, then uh, it'll be coming in the mail uh, sometime this week, hopefully. Um, and uh, yeah, also with a little bag of lollies, although when the bag of lollies came to our place, um, it was all gone by the time my wife got home from work. So um, Kathy, if you got any more of those lollies, um, I know somebody who's uh, feeling a bit ripped off. Also, um, the other thing we're wanting to letterbox drop to the, the uh, area this week is a little note just uh, letting our neighbours know that we're here to help and uh, saying, you know, if, if you need some help with picking up medications or shopping or driving, being driven to a doctor's appointment or help getting your technology sorted, um, there's people in the church that can help you with that and just offering them uh, that assistance. And so uh, the way that we will manage that from a church point of view is we, we have a, uh, it's called a, a WhatsApp group, which um, when the requests come in, we can just post those requests to the WhatsApp group and then somebody can put their hand up and say, oh, I can go and help somebody set up their Zoom or I can go and do some shopping for somebody. So uh, if you'd like to be involved in that, then uh, let Kathy know. And um, if you're not already part of the, the WhatsApp group that um, is already in place, then we can add you into that group and you can volunteer to help the neighbours uh, if, if they need some help. So it's, it's not much, but it's just something that we can do as a church to say to our community, uh, we care for you, we're here and we're able to help um, if you're in need. Uh, also, uh, uh, the Matthew and, and Jane Gray wanted to pass on their thanks to the community. Uh, Matt's father died uh, last week and we had the, the funeral on Friday in the church. And uh, Jane tells me there's been something like 730 views of the, the service already um, online. And so uh, some of you will watch that online. Many others have got, got in contact with Matt and Jane to send them your well wishes and they're very appreciative of that. So um, they just wanted to say thank you for the support and it's wonderful to be part of a church family that really cares in this way. And then finally, next week, being the first Sunday of the month, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. So you might want to get yourself some bread and some juice or, or some wine um, to have that ready at the end of tomorrow, uh, next week's, next Sunday service. Uh, that's all uh, for this morning. We'll pick up the story uh, in 1 Samuel next week. And let's close by saying the grace and then Leanne can put us into uh, some breakout rooms. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Our crowns before the lost.